Konnichiwa. Hello. If I speak too fast, please raise your hand, and I will try to slow down. Um, so today I want to talk about splitting, the crucial optimization for RubyBlock. You hear me well? Yeah? OK. Perfect. Uh, it's great to be in person again at Ruby Kagi. So I'm um, Bernard Alos. I work on Truffle Ruby at Oracle Labs in Zurich. I work on Truffle Ruby since 2014, so it's been a while. I have a PhD on parallelism in dynamic languages. I'm the maintainer of RubySpec, and I'm also a CRuby committer. Truffle Ruby, if you don't know yet, is a high-performance Ruby implementation. It is the GraalVM JIT compiler. It targets full compatibility with CRuby 3.1. Uh, including C extension, so it aims to be a drop-in replacement for CRuby. And to give an example, it can actually run Mastodon and Discourse with very minimal changes. Uh, it's on GitHub, on Twitter, on Mastodon, on, and there's also a website. So today I want to talk about splitting. And to talk about splitting, I want, back, I want to go back to the origins of it. And the origins of it is the self-programming language. The self-programming language is similar to Smalltalk, which is similar to Ruby. Uh, so it's not so far from Ruby, uh, but it was created a really long time ago in 1996. And the researcher that worked on self did many breakthrough, many fundamental research that is still used by almost all dynamic language nowadays. So here I will give four examples. So one of them is the maps or shapes, which is a better way to represent objects. And that has been used in Truffle Ruby since the beginning and in CRuby since 3.2. They also invented the optimization. So we have just-in-time compilation, which goes from Ruby code to machine code. But we also have the reverse, the optimization, which goes from machine code back to the interpreter or back to Ruby code, if you wish. Uh, and they did that, for instance, to, have a, to be able to debug, even though they also have a just-in-time compiler. Uh, they also invented polymorphic inline caches. And this I will explain later in the talk in more detail. And then also splitting. And splitting was invented in this paper in 1989, this paper by Craig Chamber and David Ungar at Stanford. And they call it the customization of splitting. And what's really amazing about this paper is the example they use, which is in self-code, actually applies to Ruby today, like it's very similar. So what we are going to do is to translate this example of self-code into Ruby. So we have a self-code on the right, and they define it on number. And the equivalent of number in Ruby is numeric. And they define a sum to function, which is the sum from the current number, from the self, until the upper bound included. So it's a very simple method, but it's a very good illustration of how splitting works. And so the code in Ruby is very straightforward. It's like sum equals zero, and then we call step from the current number until the upper bound, and we step by one, it's implicit. And then we add this to the sum, and we return the sum. Uh, and yeah, you might notice we use step and not up to, because up to only work on integer, but we want it to work for all numbers. And if we want some example call sites, we can have like sum the number from one to 10, uh, but we can also use floating points, we can also use rational, we can also use big nums. So we can use it in various different ways. And what we're going to look at is like, oh, can we compile, that is, oh, can we just in time compile numeric sum to, to machine code efficiently? Uh, and when we look at this method from a compiler point of view, like there is not much going on except this call to step. So the crucial part here is to inline step. But to inline the step method, we need to know which step method it is. Because there is numeric step, but there might be other step method. And so if we look at this from a like, static analysis point of view, if we just look at the code without any extra knowledge, we can't really know for sure, because somebody could define integer step or float step, for instance and then those would be used instead of numeric step. So also have two uh, call side at the bottom, um, and then we see one with integer and one with float to just guide us to, to reason about this. Uh, so because we can't really tell from like just looking at the code which method it will be, what dynamic language do is they have an inline cache. And an inline cache is a cache that's directly in the representation that the virtual machine used to execute. So in CRuby, that would be a cache that is part of the bytecode. In Truffle Ruby, it would be a cache that is part of the abstract syntax tree. And eventually, like, the result of this cache will be also in the machine code. So for instance, if we call sum2 with both integer and float, we have an inline cache like this with two and three. We'll say, OK, if, we have, if the self was an integer, if the class of self was an integer, uh, is an is integer, then the method is numeric step. And then if it was a float, it's also a numeric step. 
And what we do in Truffle Ruby is this, but we also have a, a small variant here, where in addition to this lookup cache, method lookup cache, we also have a core target cache. And that one is just like, okay, which method are we actually calling here? And that's actually a single method. We're only calling numeric step uh, for both cases. So that's great, and basically that gives us like, okay, most likely what we're calling there is numeric step. So far we have only seen numeric step, and probably in the future it will continue to be like that. It's not a guarantee, but it's very likely. So then at that point the compiler says, okay, let's look at numeric step. And there you're like, okay, but numeric step is huge. So this is, is not meant to be read, it's way too long, and it doesn't fit on a slide. Uh, but this is a simplified version of numeric step because it doesn't handle keyword arguments and some little edge, edge cases. Uh, but I want to make it fit on a slide, so we're going to simplify it a little bit. But first, like, why is numeric step so complicated? And the reason is because you can call numeric step in a million different ways. And this is not only for numeric step, it also happens for many other core methods in Ruby. Like if you use uh, the array square bracket, there's a million ways to call it. And the same for string square bracket and so on and many other core methods. So here I have some example. I can call one step to three. Okay, that's very easy, right? Just prints one to three. I can do it with float, of course. But I can also give what is the step value, right? I can step by two, but I can also step by minus two. I can go descending. I can also give it keyword arguments uh, because people were like, okay, which one is the step, which one is the limit? We're like, okay, let's use keyword arguments, but now we actually have more complexity uh, internally. And so you can say, okay, I step to seven by two, but you can also omit the two, and then it will step to infinity. And then finally, you can also call it without a block, and that will return an enumerator. So let's try to get step to fit on a slide. So the, here's the one simplification I will take, which is like I remove the first tree line, which is the enumerator case, and some error case if step is nil or zero, which is not really interesting here. Um, and then here we see we have two loops inside of numeric step. There is the descending one and the ascending one. And in the case we're interesting is the ascending one because some two only do this ascending. So what we're gonna do is we just move this descending case in a separate method just to get ourselves some space. All right, and then what we notice is like the most important part in this numeric step method, there's a bunch of things we do at the beginning but then the most important part is this loop, this until value bigger than limit. Uh, because like, typically the most important part to compile is the inner loop, and this is the inner loop in our case. Um, and what's inside this inner loop? Well, there's value plus equal step, which is fairly simple, uh, but it's this yield value. So it means call the block with this given value. And then like, how can we know which block we call? Same thing, we use an inline cache. So in the inline cache here, now suppose I have two call sites that I put at the end. So we have one sum to 10 and one step to three. And that will actually produce two different blocks in the inline cache. For one sum to 10, we'll have a block that's part of the sum to method. And for one step to three, it's called a block in main because like I call this kind of in the main script. Uh, it's just like this PI block, right? And that's the question like, okay, we have two blocks. What should we do? Should we inline both, neither, only one of them, which one? So let's look at the option. So we could inline both block, and then we could have something like this kind of pseudocode, right? It's like, okay, if the block is the first block, then we're gonna do the logic of that block inlined, and if the block is the second block, we do that logic inline as well. The problem is this is prevents a lot of optimization, uh, and can also make, like, imagine with many blocks, it will make the method really huge and big to compile and slow to compile. Uh, and so for instance, here, like the first block, sum plus equal i, the sum variable, uh, is actually not a variable declared inside the block, but outside of it. And so I kind of represent it here, say block author variable sum to represent there's at least two indirection in there. And these two indirection, it's actually important for performance to move them outside the loop. Because like the dot author variable doesn't change and the address of the sum variable doesn't change either. So we would want to move that outside the loop, but we just cannot because there's the, the other block. And there's also like in the else branch, I put deopt, which means deoptimize. Like if we see another block, we're gonna deoptimize, go back to the interpreter, add the entry in the inline cache, and then recompile. But so yeah, because we have two blocks here, we can't optimize it as good because if you move it outside, it would be invalid for the second block or it would do extra work for the second block. So it's just not the correct optimization uh, if there is a second block. So we only really want one block. So how can we do that? 
And then here, like I generalize also, like what if we had n blocks, right? At some point, we also can't do this forever, right? What if we have 10 blocks? Uh, it's just like, suppose we are, the, the actual block that's used, the 10 one, we have to check 10 blocks before we get there, it starts to be slow, and then this is completely impossible to compile uh, in an efficient manner. So our solution is to make multiple copies. Uh, but so you see here, I have step one and step two, but in the source code, I still only have a step method, right? Like in the beginning. This is like this step one and step two is created internally by the virtual machine. They're not like real method. You cannot call step one. It's just to illustrate, right? So basically, it will create internally different copies of step. And the first copy here will be used for the first block, the block in sum two. And the second copy will be used for the block in main. And now inside the loop, I will actually know, okay, there's only this specific block being used, and I can then optimize it much better. For instance, this block auto variable, I can move that outside the loop, or rather the compiler would do that. And what we did in this copying, that's what splitting is. So we had something like this, where we had two callers that would end up in step, but step wouldn't know, really know which block it was going to be called. It was two possibilities. And what we did is we copied step. So of this, we have step one and step two, and then no, it's straightforward. It's very clear code. The compiler can optimize this very well. The CPU doesn't like to branch and jump around a lot. It prefers to just go straight, do things one after another. And so splitting, yes, it's just kind of this. It's making copies. Um, and specifically, what we do here is make a copy of step for each caller of step. And the interesting part, which I was hinting at, was we actually then get also profiles that are specific to a caller, right? The inline cache for the block is then specific for that caller. And that's really powerful. That gives us so much more information. Because if we had a single profile for step, we would see like all possibilities in a big enough application. Uh, but here, because it's specific for one caller, it's very precise. And so splitting into a Ruby is just a bit more general than that. Uh, so first, I want to introduce some term. So when we talk about an inline cache, we can say it's monomorphic, polymorphic, or megamorphic. So monomorphic means the single entry. Polymorphic means two or plus entry up to some limit. And megamorphic means there are too many entries to cache. And monomorphic is the ideal case, right? It's the most optimizable one. Polymorphic is a bit less good because as we saw, we cannot optimize as good. Uh, but megamorphic is the worst one because then we just cannot cache anymore. So if we have a megamorphic call side, if we call, for instance, more than eight different methods at the same call side, which is possible if you call, like, I don't know, hash, the hash method for, for hashing, or uh, inspect, for instance, uh, then you just then have to, you might have a megamorphic call side, and then what happens is you will actually do method lookup every time. And method lookup, like, if it's uncached, very expensive. It's multiple, multiple hash map lookup, right? So it's, it's very bad. Um, and so, yes. What's important in virtual machine is to avoid megamorphic case and also as much as possible polymorphic. And splitting is a big solution for that. And so Truffle Ruby, what it does precisely is whenever it detects polymorphism or megamorphism, it tries to use splitting to make it monomorphic again. And in Truffle Ruby, once we decide to split a given method, like numeric step, we will split it for each call site. But more than that, if we see that there's still polymorphism, we might split further up. So we'll give an example here. So suppose we have two call to sum two. We have one sum to 10 and 1.0 sum to 10 zero. So one with integer, one with float. They both call sum two, which calls step. And inside step, we have this until value bigger than limit. Uh, yes, this is part of the instruction, the code inside the loop. And this value bigger than limit looks simple, but actually it cannot know, right? No, it's possible this integer bigger two or float bigger two. And that's kind of bad because we're at the innermost loop and now we don't know which method we're gonna call. So what we do is we split, but we cannot split step here because some two just wouldn't know which step to call, which step copy to call. So we have to split some to two. So it's like this. Uh, and then here again, it's straightforward, it's simple, it's very optimizable. So let's go for to an example. So we had some two. And now we imagine we have one call site which is one sum to 10. It doesn't have to be 10 literally, it could be any integer that maybe passed via an argument or something. But the point is like they are both integer receiver, integer argument. And what we do in Truffle Ruby is we profile the arguments, specifically the class of the arguments. So here, uh, in this copy of sum two, in this split of sum two, uh, we saw that upper bound is always seen so far as an integer. 
So what it means is we're going to check, is it an integer at the beginning of the method? And then after we can assume it's an integer, we can prove that it's an integer because it has been checked. OK, and then we go into this step method, and then we have this uh, inline cache. And actually, here we have a single inline cache entry. We don't have the float anymore because now it's a, it's a split, right? Uh, and so, OK, let's inline into step. And in step, we do the same thing. We also have an argument profile. And then we see the limit is always an integer. It was this upper bound. And then there's no other argument. So it means step is not passed. And we also profile that it is not passed. And that's very useful, because it means step then must be the default value, which is 1. The compiler can figure that all out. And there's a, yeah, there's a block, but we don't care at this point. Um, and step, because we know it's 1, highlighted here in orange, all the occurrence, we can replace it, right? Or the compiler can replace it with 1 in the code. So it does that. And then it notice 1 smaller than 0. And the compiler can say, well, obviously, that's false. So the sending is false. And then we can simplify the sending to false as well. And then we have a bunch of code removed. And compile, like, it, just, it knows it's unreachable. It's not going to be used. So we can simplify it. And then here we have limit or equal float infinity. But we know that limit is an integer. And the or equal operator only does something if it's false or nil, which is not the case in integer. So we can remove this. Or the compiler can remove this. And then we have one more thing. I said that we profile arguments, but we also profile self, uh, just because it's useful as well. So self, in this case, is an integer. This copy of the this split of step is always called with self as an integer. And the beginning, we have value equals self, so value is an integer. OK, and then we have value bigger than limit, and now we know this is integer bigger than. We, could have, like, we would have known this via the inline cache, but here, it's already proven, so we don't need to check anything anymore. So for this bigger than call, we don't need to check the class of value. We already know it. Uh, so that's even better. And then for value plus equal one, the same thing. Uh, and then there's one more thing else to optimize, which is like I did this value limit one. One was the, actually the step, if any of them is flawed. And I wrote it like this just so it fits on the slide, but the original expression is like this, like if value is a float, or limit is a float, or one is a float. And let's go through it. So is, is value a float? No, value is an integer, we know it. Is limit a float? No, limit is an integer, we know it. And one is, the, is an integer, not a float. So this world condition is false. This is world dead code, so we can remove it again. OK, now step is getting really simple. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to inline it. So we have our, both our method here, sum to and step. And inlining is kind of copy and pasting and adapt the variable names. So here we inline step into sum2, and we get this. So now we have sum2 with the loop of a step inside it. And we already know a lot, so we still know what's the bigger than the plus equal. And the one thing that's left is proc sum plus equal i call that remains, right? That was the block that was part of sum2, and it's still there. We didn't optimize that yet. But we have a block, and we immediately call it, while we can just inline it, right? Or we can do it via the inline cache or anyhow. And then we can just have the logic in line. So we can just have it like this. But there's one tricky part, which is like, OK, but there was this proc allocation. We create a proc object. Uh, but Graal, or the GraalVM compiler, is able to optimize this away via escape analysis. So it can see that this proc object is not used anywhere. It doesn't escape the compilation. And so it says, OK, I don't need to allocate it. I can just reason about it, replace every usage by its fields, and so on. And then I don't need to allocate anything. And then it's the same as this. And now what we have here is as good as this C code. So we optimize Ruby as good as C, even though it was much more expressive and much more complicated here. And like this C code here, the only real difference is that in Ruby we do an overflow check. But this overflow check, at least in Truffle Ruby, is quite efficient because like actually the CPU, whenever it does an add instruction, uh, it would actually set a flag if there was an overflow. And then there's another inst instruction called GO, jump on overflow, which is like jump to some other place in the code if there was an overflow, which is rare, rare, of course. And so in the end, this overflow check are pretty cheap. So what we did is we were tr with splitting and with Drawfarabit just in time compiler, we could compile this Ruby code as good as C, but there's an advantage. Actually, this works for integer, but it also works for float, for rational, for big num, and it doesn't have any overflow problem. And what would happen if we use for float, we would compile it a little bit differently, right? So now the types, for instance, would all be float instead of integer, and the same if it was rational. So every version, for instance, the float and rational would also be very well optimized for that specific usage. 
So let's do some benchmarking. So here I have a few usage at the beginning, and just to represent like in a bigger application or a bigger Ruby program, I would call sum to or step in many different ways. And here I just want to call it in different ways to, to kind of represent that. And then what I actually benchmark is the, like the, the line before the last, I benchmark one sum to 1,000. And what we see here is like we have zero is the baseline, so it's just gonna be one, and then bigger is better, right? It's as, many, as fast as Cerubi. So for instance, if I use Truffle Ruby, but without splitting, I am 15 times faster. So that's already a lot. And that's thanks to the Jesse Time compiler. This is Cerubi without YG. This is normal Cerubi 3.1. Um, but then if I use splitting, it's 116 times faster than Cerubi. And that's really like a big speed up. And we see like splitting here gives a speed up of 7.7 .7 times. So it's really the power of splitting here, because now like the version we had is as good as I showed in the previous slides. Now it's as good as C code, but like the version without splitting would just be a mess of like so many conditions. It's still just in time compile, it's better than interpreter, but not, not as much. And this is not only sum two. So if we look at some other benchmark, if we look at opt carrot, we see that Trufferby without splitting is five times as fast as Cerubi, but with splitting is seven plus seven times as fast which may be quite impressive because I think in, in OptCara there's probably less opportunity for splitting because there are less blocks used. There are not that many blocks used. It's a, so OptCara is a NES interpreter, so it's kind of maybe lower level Ruby code than typical, although it uses some fancy Ruby features as well. And then if we look at RailsBench from the YGIT bench suite, we see that CRuby is one, then TruffleRuby without splitting is 1.36 times as fast, but Trufferby with splitting is 2.75 times as fast. So that seems to show like Rails, or at least this Rails bench benchmark, benefits a lot from splitting, right? It's about two times faster just from splitting. And that's kind of like, it's almost too much, right? It's like no single compiler optimization usually makes every benchmark two times faster. And what happens here, splitting is a bit like inlining, which we call like the mother of all optimization. Because it's kind of an optimization enabler. Like, because we have splitting and inlining, it enables other optimization to kick in, while before they would just have no opportunity, right? If we don't inline, we could see very little code, we can't optimize much. If we don't split, we would have like a very generic profile with so many conditions, and then it's very hard to optimize properly. Or not possible entirely. And then here, I don't want to compare here, it's also all number from a year ago, sorry for that. Uh, but it's just to give an idea, like how much splitting and inlining can give, right? General idea. So here it was the result on YG bench at that time. There were 14 benchmarks, and we see Truffle Ruby is quite ahead. And we think part of that is because of splitting and inlining. I don't have the number without splitting here, but we can imagine like a sizable portion of this is actually splitting. There was a, a recent paper about splitting. Uh, by Sophie Kaleba, uh, Stefan Marr, Richard Jones, and Octave Larose. And they analyzed the runtime call side behavior of Ruby application. So basically they analyzed whether inline caches for calls are monomorphic, polymorphic, or megamorphic, uh, and also other criteria. And they find that Truffle Ruby has two ways to reduce polymorphism. Uh, there's this two-level inline cache for method call that we saw at the beginning. So we have a method lookup cache and we have a call target cache and then splitting. And specifically, if we take one of the, one of the examples from the paper, they also run RailsBench. And so that initially, in RailsBench, there's about 7% of all calls that are polymorphic. So 7% of all call sites call two or, one, or more possible methods at the same call site. And there's also half a percent of megamorphic call. And that's actually not so small, right? Like, ideally, you would have zero of both, or so a very small number, right? Because even if it's half a percent of megamorphic call, remember that every of this call site will have to do method lookup every time. So it will already be slow, even if it's only half a percent. And what they see is that after the tool of an inline cache uh, for method lookup, like it halves the polymorphic call, and it also reduces most megamorphic call. Um, and so, yeah, this two-level inline cache is like, okay, what method is actually called and is separated from the actual method lookup itself. So we still know what method's gonna be called in the end. In that case, although the lookup will be probably still a bit slower. And then after splitting, what's really amazing here is both are 0%. Um, 
And that's kind of like unexpected, uh, but that was the result. So basically, like through this tool of inline cache and splitting, we could remove all form of polymorphism and megamorphism for calls uh, on Rails bench, but also on all other 44 benchmarks of the paper. So in conclusion, uh, splitting is a technique from the CellVM research, uh, invented 34 years ago, but it still applies very well today to dynamic languages. And specifically, it applies well to Ruby, because we have blocks. And if a method takes a block and we want to compile it efficiently, we want to inline the block. But we can only do this well if we split, basically. Uh, and it's not only for blocks, but also other form of polymorphism we didn't really talk about. But any form of like, okay, do I have multiple possibilities? Splitting can help. And we see it completely remove polymorphism and megamorphism, all, all these 44 benchmark in the paper by Sophie Kaleba. And it gives impressive speed of like 7.7 time on sum two, two, two times on Rails bench, and 1.5 time on Dr. Carrot. And I would like to talk about a few more cool things about Trophy Ruby before ending the talk. Um, so in Trophy Ruby and in GraalVM, which is kind of like the, the parent project of Trophy Ruby, we can do many interesting things. So in addition to splitting here, I, I say a few other features that I think might, might interest you. So of interoperability, that's kind of like maybe the most, one of the most important features of GraalVM is you can call other languages in the same process and with no overhead. Like typically, if you use different language, either you have to like, I don't know, go through the network or something, or there is some serialization going on. But here there's actually nothing. There's a whole like research there, there's an interoperability protocol to call very efficiently. So for instance, you can evaluate Python code and you can interoperate with it. And also like if I do something like import malprotlib or like I get an object from Python, when the subject is passed to Ruby, it actually behaves like a Ruby object. It has all the kernel and object method, for instance. And you can really use it like a Ruby object. So for instance, if it was a Python array or Python dictionary, uh, it would actually behave exactly like a Ruby hash or, well, in the other reverse order, but uh, a Ruby array or a Ruby hash. Uh, something else interesting is uh, in presentation two years ago is like we actually have a genesis time compiler for regular expression in Trophy Ruby. So that makes it probably like the fastest Trophy, uh, regular expression engine for Ruby. And this also, like this uh, genesis time compiler, also uses a different way to execute regular expression. It uses like this DFA approach where it's actually always linear. Uh, so that also avoids regular expression denial of service. Uh, which has already been talked a few times, I think, in this conference by now. And it doesn't work for every regular expression, but it works for most of them. And we have a way like, to warn if it, doesn't, if it doesn't fit into that case and other, and other things. Another thing is like Truffle Ruby, actually much like JRuby, can execute Ruby code in parallel. And soon we'll also be, be, be able to execute C extension in parallel. Right now there's a flag to do it, but it's a bit hacky. What we want to use is there's already a way to mark a C extension as safe to be executed in parallel. It's like this RBX Ractor safe. Uh, and we want to reuse this so we can actually like then automatically execute C extension that support it in parallel. Uh, because GraalVM supports not just one language but many, so there's Ruby, but there's Java, Python, JavaScript, R, and so on. Uh, we also have like, the tooling is very language agnostic, right? So we have a LSP and DAP, which is like a language server protocol and debug adapter protocol. It's basically like the, the way to integrate with an IDE or with an editor in a language ag agnostic manner. And for instance, like just a simple example is like when you have a backtrace in Truffle Ruby, it mixes Ruby and C frames or C, C stack entries. So that's quite useful. You can actually debug into C code, step into C code and back into Ruby and so on. One important aspect um, is also like the, the JIT compiler, which is called Graal or the GraalVM compiler. And we think we actually have the, the most advanced Ruby JIT compiler currently. Like it can inline Ruby code, C code, and Java code. And Java code is important because Truffle Ruby, the interpreter, is itself written in Java. So it can actually inline through all these languages and actually other languages that we can interoperate with, like for instance, Python and so on. So that's quite powerful and like, gives us more opportunity to optimize. Then we also have splitting, which we talked about. There's also partial evaluation, which is kind of this technique that allows it to support multiple languages. So even though we have actually like technically only a, a Ruby interpreter, we partially evaluate it 
And what we get is basically we get a JSTM compiler for Ruby code. Even though this JSTM compiler is completely generic and can compile any other GraalVM language. And then there's also some uh, important optimization in the GraalVM compiler itself, like partial escape analysis, like I mentioned it earlier. Well, like uh, we, we see that this proc is a news, and so we don't need to allocate it. And finally, like because this is kind of based on, on the JVM and so on, uh, you can also choose uh, which garbage collector you want to use. So you can choose if you want more throughput or latency or something in between, right? So parallel GC would be I want all the throughput, but then I will have longer GC pauses. Uh, G was in the middle, and then the GC would be I want the, the slowest latency, right? I want my GC pause to be below one millisecond or something, right? And that, of course, will reduce a little bit of throughput, but then it will be like almost impossible to notice that the GC is even happening. Uh, if you want to try Truffle Ruby, we have a, a 23.0 preview one release, and soon in one month, we will have the 23.0 release. And you can install it with your favorite Ruby manager or installer. Uh, just look at the readme on GitHub. Uh, there you can have all the details. You can also use it via Docker and so on. And with that, I would like to thank you. And probably it's easier if you ask me any question after the talk. I'm very happy to talk about Truffle Ruby or anything. I also have some stickers if you want. There's also some in the hallway. And thank you.